That song always throws me because I think it has more than one verse. And then some of the other songs throw me because they've added like 40 verses to it. I never know. It's hard. It's hard. Life's hard. I wonder how many of us have forgotten. Forgotten that we are in a war. We are in a, a battle. We are in a race. Running a race. How many of us are engaged? How many of us are engaged. I think there's a lot of people who don't know this statement we've just made. They don't even realize we're in a battle or a race. And then some do know but just don't seem to care. We may have some here that are in that condition even now, this morning, in this place. If we are to run the race. If we are to wage the war effectively when it comes to faith, then we need to be properly prepared for that. We need to know how to run. We need to know how to fight. How to correctly be engaged in these things and how to stay at it once we are engaged in these things. And all of that can present some detriment to the one who does realize we're in a race or in a war and desires to be part of that. One of the most dangerous words and actions for a Christian is the word surrender. Surrender. And too many Christians surrender. The author of Hebrews does a fantastic job. Of course he would. It's inspired by the mind of God himself. At delivering to us some coaching instructions that come from God about not just the race itself or not just the battle itself, but how to prepare for it and how to be engaged in it and how to stay engaged in it once we are in it. I hope that you'll turn over here to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. That's where I want you to be this morning, and we'll all be there together. We'll read that text in just a little bit together, at least a piece of that text, and draw some conclusions from that this morning. While you're turning over there, welcome everybody today. Um, if you're using, by the way, the Pew Bible, I've memorized this. We were looking at the Pew Bible page of 1195. Now we're on 1192. Six. So we, <laughs> we, we're really progressing quickly here. Uh, but I hope that you've enjoyed the study. We are drawing cl uh, close to the end. We may have one or two more lessons that we're going to pick out of chapter 12. But uh, been in, engaged in a study, uh, for those who are newer among us, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 12. For the benefit of all of us this morning, we'll, t we'll begin just by looking at a piece of chapter 11, just briefly and then move on into chapter 12 together. So if you're using the Pew Bible this morning, that Burgundy Bible there, it's 1196. Hope that you have your Bible with you. And if you made the mistake of forgetting it or you don't have a Bible, I'll tell you what you do. You bring your Bible next time, or if you don't have one, take the one that is there in the pew home with you and utilize that thing because that is the Word of God. And there is nothing more important to us than God's Word. It holds the key to life. So, we welcome everybody here today. Glad that you're here. If you're a visitor with us this morning, hope that, uh, that you are, have already been made to feel welcome. If not, uh, it's because you got here late. And so if you'll just stay for a minute or two afterward, that will be rectified quick and short order. And uh, we do love you being here and truly do enjoy your presence. I want you to be here every time that you can be. And of course, good to see all who are members with us this morning as well. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, looking there together. I'd like for you to just take a quick glance up at chapter 11 of your text. It'll be beneficial for you to do that. If you're planning not to, I want you to. I want you to think about whatever, where it is we've come from. It will add to our study today together. I want you to recall or notice from this text that the writer has mentioned some examples of those that we call our heroes of faith. 
They are our heroes of faith because of the kind of faith we see in them. And the God who shines through them makes them strong and victorious. And we have mentioned this before, just mention it quickly uh, this morning of where we've come from. Abel, for example, by faith, we're told, offered acceptable sacrifices. Enoch, by faith, walked and walked with and pleased God. Noah, by faith, believed God about unseen things, things he had not yet seen. Sarah believed God to be faithful, trustworthy. In, with, with regard or because of his word. Abraham believed God would do humanly impossible things. Down in verses 22 and 23, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Jochebed, as well as Amram, the parents of Moses, they through faith passed along those concepts to the next generation. You may recall we talked about that as passing along the baton of faith to the generation that's coming be, uh, behind us. Moses, in verses 24 through 29, a great man of faith, chose God over being a prince, stood up to Pharaoh, kept the Passover, and even crossed the Red Sea with the people of God to the destruction of the enemies who pursued them by the power of God. The faithful people of Israel, down in verse 30, they watched the walls of Jericho fall inward, fall down, after, being, uh, uh, after obeying the will of God in, in, in the instructions he gave for that to happen. Rahab, in verse 31, gave rescue to the spies. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, verses 32 through 34 of chapter 11. Through faith they conquered kingdoms, they enforced justice, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the power of fire, they escaped the edge of the sword. The text says they were made strong out of weakness and they became mighty in power, put foreign em enemies to fight. In verse 35, there were women who because of their faith received their dead back from uh, uh, from death by way of resurrection. There were those who were tortured, refusing to accept reprieve because they, through faith, saw a better resurrection to life. There were those in verses 30, 36 through 40 as we finish off that chapter who were mocked and flogged and chained and imprisoned and stoned and sawn in two. Those killed by the sword, the text says. Those were, there were those who were outcast from society. They were destitute. They were afflicted. And they were mistreated and even homeless. Because of their faith, they are commended, verse 39 says. By faith, they wait for us to finish our fight. They wait for us to finish our race so that along with us, they may be made perfect down at the end of that chapter, verse 40. These have been listed, ladies and gentlemen, not so that we can bow down and worship them. People do that with people that we read of. They call them saints. They build statues to them, literally kiss the statue's feet. But that is not why they're given to us in Scripture, and they are remembered by God throughout all these generations and generations to come. The reason that they are listed, we are told, is to encourage us and to educate us who would come after them about what a real faith like theirs can do in the life that you and I live. In other words, they're listed so that we can be more like them. So that we can become people of faith like they were people of faith. To understand it is achievable, and not only achievable, it is absolutely expected by God in your life and in my life. Not less, but to be like them in our faith. So I want to correct the idea, if anybody this morning has it, that these are people held to a standard up here that we could never attain to. And the whole point of chapter 11 is to say, not only can you attain it, God expects us to attain it. They are not to be looked at as those who are heralded throughout all time so that we could just wish we could be like that. The point is we should be like that, and we can be. 
These people were no different than we are with regard to their connection to God and the faith that they lived and displayed. We can be these kinds of people, and that is hugely exciting, isn't it? Can you imagine God looking at you the way that he looked at Moses or the prophets? It's the point of the text. That is how God looks at his people, even still today, when they are faithful and work through faith. Consider how each one of these men and women that are listed had to make a choice between courage in faithfulness and fear in faithlessness. You see, ladies and gentlemen, these two things cannot coexist within us at the same time. We are always, at every moment, either one or the other. We are either acting faithlessly or we are acting faithfully. Paul reminds Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of timidity. Or some versions actually say the word faith, uh, uh, faithlessness. He's not given us that spirit of fear, but of power, of love, of self-control or discipline. Sound mind, some versions read, with regard to the faith. How does that happen in a Christian's life? Well, by doing what they did. That's why we just said that's why God gave us chapter 11. So we could be like them. And what did they do? Chapter 12, the writer deals with that very question. Not what did they do in action, but, he, but the point is, what was inside them that caused them to be this way? That's chapter 12, at least at the beginning of the chapter. And so we go there together this morning. Chapter 12 looks at some powerful truths that are going to result in a life of faith that is just like the ones we read of there in chapter 11. Wouldn't we all love for that to be our day-to-day -day existence? To be like them. And this passage is teaching us exactly how that occurs. He starts with the word therefore in the text. It is a noteworthy word because it is a conclusionary word that references us back, our minds back, to where we just came from. Out of chapter 11, looking at those people. Therefore. So the thing that he's about to talk about, we should understand, is based on what we have already seen there in chapter 11 regarding these people. So he begins there in chapter 12, verse 1, reading along with me. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that word witness is the word martus in the Greek, and it is the idea, you can even hear our word martyr within that word, martus. And it is the idea not, we, we often may think of martyr as somebody who dies. We emphasize the death. That's not the idea behind a martyr, brothers and sisters. The idea behind a martyr is someone who has displayed and witnessed a belief or system worth dying for and willing to do it. And so the, the idea is not the death itself necessarily, but it's the idea of providing an example or a testimony Martyrs were willing to die for that, or are willing to die for that. But the point is that they are also examples or testimonies of something that is worth dying for. And so he makes that point right here. A lot of times when we think about the word witness, we're thinking in terms of a stadium of people. And maybe that's a good way to look at this, but the clearest and most, most proper way that the, that the scriptures are teaching it here is they are witnesses, not that they're watching us, maybe they are, we don't know that information, but the idea behind witness is they are saying something to us. They are witnessing something. What are they witnessing? They're witnessing something about faith. So he says, like them, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. That's what they're talking to us about. That's what chapter 11 is all about. This is what they're teaching us. This is what they're saying to us. Lay aside the things that cling, uh, that are weights that hold to us, closely to us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the founder, the author, the perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured 
from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. I want you to find in your text there the words, let us. It's important to notice those words. Let us also. Let us be like them. You and me, us, also like they lay aside every weight maybe it occurs to you as you read that text as it as it does to me and and that is just this simple idea that they they didn't these people did not finish strong because they were lazy people of god They didn't finish strong because they were unfocused and here and there and back again and then out there and then over there and they just lived these chaotic type lives on and off again in their their service to God. I'm not saying they didn't have sin. We've already talked about how each one of these characters we, we have record of, for the majority of them, sin that they committed in their life as well. What I'm saying is though that they had this focused view on God Generally speaking, during their lifetime. That's what we want. That's what we should be doing. Struggles will come. Difficulties will arise. Focus is upon God. You know, as runners, as it's referred to here in our text this morning, those who ran and still do today, Oftentimes wear, as you've heard probably explained before, weights on their extremities or on their body. They train with those things on. So that when they take them off, they feel even lighter and stronger. And they can move more quickly in the actual competition, you know. Here we're told, put aside every weight things that will encumber us or weigh us down or the things that are really going to tire us out. You know, people training, they do that on purpose so that they can run more efficiently later. But the writer here is saying, don't think you're going to run this race with all these weights. You can't do it. You'll never do it. It makes us consider the question, what is it that might be slowing you and me down? in our growth to be a stronger, more faithful person of God. I guess I can't make this guarantee, but if I could, I would. That every one of us have some weights of some kind. What is it that may be a weight in your life compared to to what would free us up. Here we're talking about something that is unnecessary. Unnecessary. That's a weight. Maybe it's an old unhealthy habit of some kind that just weighs your conscience down. That's a weight. That's a weight. Gets us sidetracked or just makes us encumbered. Just, just, just weighed down. Maybe it is giving too much weight to a relationship. Maybe that relationship influences you to be weaker rather than a stronger person for God. Maybe it is a negative attitude about life. I find the older I get, sometimes that actually is the case for me. A negative attitude rather than than an attitude that sees the greatness of God and the blessings of life and can step out of a situation to see life in a better light as lived for God. Maybe complaining rather than counting those blessings. Maybe impatience having a, I think this is maybe a big one, having a short view of life rather than the long view of life regarding the things that we are told you will go through this as a child of God. Maybe it's busyness, non-spiritual desires, wants, needs. Maybe it is an argumentative spirit 
difficult rather than pleasant and friendly, affectionate to others and loving, like we see in God Himself. We could go on with this list, right? I mean, I bet you, I bet you have two or three things that just since we've been talking about this, you could add to that, to that list. Maybe it's not your problem. Maybe it's just an observation. Maybe it is your problem. But we see the point. And that is that we, we, we in, in humanity, we struggle with weight. As Christians, we struggle with weight. Spiritual weight, brothers and sisters, is anything that makes us heavier than we need to be, that in any way holds us back, makes us lazy or too out of shape to spiritually and effectively run with greater ease, to fight with greater agility or strength. He says, lay aside, and we're going to insert the word there, unnecessary weights. Lay aside every weight that holds you back. Well, you've heard that talked about before if, you, if you're familiar with this, this text. Uh, you, can't, you can't even talk about this text without talking about how there's, a, there's an idea about weights there. And we've got to lay those weights aside. All of us have probably heard at least similar concepts and, and uh, introductions to this particular section of the text. But I want you to notice that he gets a little more serious in all this, maybe a little more pointed. Maybe that's a better word, maybe not more serious, more pointed in all of this when he begins to identify sin let us lay aside sin which clings so closely lay aside literally that which misses the mark causes us to wander from the faith how many times God wor- God's word would warn us Do not go to the right. Do not go to the left. I did it backward. To the right (laughs) or to the left. But straight on. Don't miss the mark. Here, it is in reference to faith. It could be any sin. I understand It could be the sin of covetousness, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. It could be any of that. It could be all those things that fall under that category. I'm going to try not to make it loud by bumping it too hard. But I would suggest to you that it is one sin in particular that is in mind by the Hebrew writer. What is it that we have been talking about since chapter 11? What's the main thing we've been talking about since chapter 11? Now, if you haven't been here for that, I I wouldn't necessarily expect you to know. But if you're one who's been here through all of chapter 11 and you can't answer that, I got homework for you to do. You go home right after services and you reread chapter 11 five times, no less. (laughs) Faith, right? Faith. By faith. By faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. By faith, Moses. By faith, all the prophets. By faith, everything that is listed in chapter 11, all by faith. I guess go ahead and turn this one on, whoever's running the mic there, because this thing is, uh, is just distracting. I'm, it's hard enough for me to do what I do without getting distracted, so I struggle enough already. By faith. Faith is the main thing. And the sin to which we all have and can fall victim, that sin that we're talking about is called faithlessness. If being right before God is to walk in faith, then the sin that's spoken of contextually would be faithlessness. That's a big encompassing word. How easy it is for us to look completely unlike those that we read of here in chapter 11. It's easy for us to look unlike those people and instead to be filled with anxieties and doubt, even distrust in God. Our faith is always being tested. We are always under pressure. The moments that we're not stand out as highlights in our life. 
We feel like we're on top of the world when we're not being tested in our faith. But most always, we are being tested. Well, if God is really caring about me, then why would He? And then fill in a blank because we've all said or thought something like that. If God really is faithful, then why is this happening to me? Why am I being, why am I being put through this thing? If God really is listening, then why are my prayers not being answered? I keep praying this one thing over and over and over again. I've done it maybe for a year or two or three or ten. And God just doesn't, He's just not listening. None are exempted from the struggle of the sin of faithlessness in our life. None of us. It doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian. I'm not saying it doesn't get better. <laughs> I do believe that we grow in our faith and we strengthen and we get stronger. But there's always the temptation to be faithless. Even if it is just for a split second. It isn't easy, is it? It requires a lot. It requires mindset and it requires heart. It requires a, a simple idea of I'm going to grow through this thing. I will be determined to be a person of faith. That's a choice. And sometimes we can fail in that choice. It clings to us. Every one of us. Young, old, in between, male, female, it doesn't matter. And I would remind you that it is deceptive thinking to believe that Satan doesn't know it. And he could easily quote to us, just as we easily read Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. Satan knows that verse. And he'd like to make that happen. So what that tells us is great testimonies and witnesses do not come from lukewarm, mediocre, moderate lives for God. Don't you think, ladies and gentlemen, we struggle enough with that, we shouldn't pile on extra weight that's unneeded? Don't you think that that's the truth? Don't we struggle enough with our faith that we, that, we, that we would have the sense enough to say, I'm not going to pile this weight. I'm not going to put this thing. I'm not going to do that thing. I'm going to keep my eyes straight ahead. I'm not going to the right. I don't want to go to the left. But yet we struggle with that, don't we? By our witness, even under duress, it comes by deciding to be like them, to lay aside encumberments, weights, difficulties that slow us down, that hold us back. It's a choice to lay aside faithless living. And the reason we know that is because we read about it right there in chapter 11 in the lives of our forefathers and foremothers in the faith. They chose that. It didn't just happen to them, right? They chose it. Even under duress, they chose it. Even under persecution and difficulty and problems in their life, they chose it. They chose faith. And they rejected the sin that so easily besets us or clings to us, pulls us down, faithlessness. So what are some reasons for failing to lay aside these things and settling for less in our potential than what we ought. What are some of those things? Maybe we think that we're not good at something. Maybe we don't have all the resources. Maybe our chances of failing as we calculate from a human perspective seem great. Greater than our chances of success. All of that shows signs, brothers and sisters, of Sin that easily besets us, call faithlessness. 
Because what we learn from Hebrews chapter 11 is really that's no different from saying God will only use the best and the brightest. Those who don't really need him. Well, that's not what I read in chapter 11. At all, actually. <laughs> in fact, what we read in chapter 11 are these people were nobody and nothing and would never have been remembered without the power of God and their faith at work in their life because they didn't have what it took to be the people God was calling them to be. Naturally. God had to give it to them. He can only use us in areas where we think we excel. Who do I have faith in again? Is it me? Is it my ability? Is it my power? Or is it God who provides all these things? What do we learn from chapter 11? And he will only bring glory to himself when I use my talents to bring glory to me. Well, what was it that we again learned from chapter 11? <laughs> For example, in Moses, who killed the man because he knew God was going to use him, his abilities, his place in power to deliver the people of God only to exist for many years in the wilderness, watching sheep, waiting. And God comes to him and says, now I'll give you the abilities that you need to do what I'm telling you to do. And where was Moses then? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't have the ability. I don't have, I don't have the position. I don't have the place anymore. What do we learn from chapter 11? The point is, faith is not about one's own power and abilities and self-perception, and that's all it is, self-perception. But it abounds in believing and trusting in God's power, in God's ability, in God's promises. It abounds in living by faith. Even in the face of inadequacy, and even in the face of fear. In the lives of those of Hebrews chapter 11, we see God working through them despite their inexperience, their inability, and their fear. That was God at work. That was God making things happen and making things possible. How wonderful it is, ladies and gentlemen. During the difficulty and the fear and the temptations or the tests, we trust God to handle all of that. It changes us, doesn't it? It changes us. It changes our attitudes. It keeps us from falling into self-pity and bitterness and faithless doubt. Psalm 55, verse 22. What a great psalm that is. He says in this, in this text, I got behind there on my charts, I apologize. Psalms 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Isn't that an awesome passage? When we struggle in our faith, this ought to be a kind of a passage that comes to mind. This one or another like it. There are others. It's God upon whom we rely. It is God who sustains the man or the woman of faith. He says then, let us, he sets forth this positive statement. He says, let, he says, let us run with endurance. Run with endurance. First notice the word run. It's the same Greek word that we read in places like 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. You might remember where Paul tells Timothy, I have fought a good fight. Same, that word fought, same word as the word run. And the same thing happens again in, or is said again in, in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 26. He uses the word fought there. Well, what makes the difference if it's the same Greek word? What makes the difference is simply context. But here's the thing. Don't focus on the activity. That's not the point. What it tells us is Paul is talking about struggles that we have to deal with to keep and to grow our faith. Is it a struggle to run? Can you be lazy and run? Well, you can. You're not going to get anywhere. You're certainly not going to win anything. <laughs> takes a struggle to run is that true in fighting it's true in fighting if you were ever a, a young person got in fight with your siblings or 
with friends who wanted to steal your girlfriend or whatever it was. You got in a fight. You know, it takes effort to fight, doesn't it? <laughs> then I want you to notice that word endurance there within the context. Endurance. It means to abide under. Not just to abide under. It's the idea of staying under. Well, I guess the same word is abide. It's to stay under a struggle. A weight. While continuing to move forward. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it is not that we have no weights. Didn't we just read earlier? Throw off the weight. What weight? Unnecessary weight. Why? Because we have enough that we have to run with. There's other weight that we have to, that we have to run with. It's important weight. It's the weight we've got to have to survive in the run or in the fight. You see, a soldier can throw off unnecessary weight. That's totally different from throwing off a shield and the sword and all the armor and all the stuff he's got to have in order to survive. Those are weights. One is unnecessary. The other is absolutely necessary. And here God is saying through the Hebrew writer, you have weight. Throw off what you don't need. Throw off what's going to hold you back and use the weight that I'm giving you to protect and endure under the conflict, under the struggle. Endurance is not a reference to escaping trying times, but to abiding under those trying times and seeing them through. That's important. In our world, we are rarely encouraged to think like that. We hardly ever think like that from a worldly perspective. Our world, the truth is, turns that all upside down. It discounts anything that's hard to endure. It, it blames everybody and, and everything that is unpleasant on everybody and everything else. Give me someone to blame for what it is I have to go through. It seeks to eliminate things like endurance and overcoming. And when it doesn't, those are the news highlights that we see. Well, can you believe this man ran to that burning car, pulled that person out? Who does that? You see, that's the way the world thinks. That's crazy. That's like beyond reason. Christianity does exactly the opposite. Christianity expects for us to excel beyond the norm. To rise to a higher level through faith. Why? Not because of our own power, but because of God's power. We see that through faith. That propels us into areas we never would go otherwise. That causes us to live in ways we would never consider living if it had not been for the power of God at work through faith. The world assumes that anything can be acquired in short term. After all, we are highly we have great high technology. You want to know something about some little town in Spain somewhere? Just look it up real quick. You can get it that fast. You want to know how to diet? You want to know how to strength training? You want to know all these things? Just pull it up. It takes no time, no effort at all. Our attention span has been conditioned brothers and sisters to 30 second commercials and in our day it's less than that it's five second youtube ads we have a hard time just paying attention sitting here this morning don't we how many times has our mind fled from where it should be to somewhere it should not be we have difficulty in our faith it is constantly with us it isn't difficult in such a world to be interested in the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. It is difficult to stay interested in the gospel. It isn't hard to become a Christian. It's hard to stay a Christian. It's hard to sustain interest. And there's a great market in the religious world for experiences Little enthusiasm for patient obtaining of a strong, enduring faith. But many who are quick to be interested, they just don't sustain it through faith. Came across a quote that's 
says religion in our time has been captured by the tourist mindset. And the reason is because I am a great tourist. I love to, I love tourism. <laughs> I mean, you take me to a town and I'm going to eat the food they eat and I'm going to see the places of interest there, historic things. I love that stuff. So I got that. Maybe you can relate to that as well. I understand the concept he's getting at. We go to sea. And, and while we're there, we want new personalities to see. I like to see the way other people live in other countries around the world. It's fascinating to me. I don't want to live there, though. I want to live here. People do that with religion, with truth. Just trying to get a new experience. You see, it's all about the moment. It's not about the long term. Somehow expand on our humdrum lives to experience something new and neat and cool and exciting and the next thing, you know, 10 minutes down the road that no longer is what it was. And people who become like Christians drop like flies. It seems everybody wants shortcuts, instant credit for eternity. <laughs> Only touching high spots. Only experiencing the best. As soon as the food's not that good, though, I'm out. As soon as the people aren't that interesting, I'm out. As soon as it doesn't bring me joy, I'm out. I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the thing of Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 is, you're going to endure some hard times, and it's not going to always be fun. You can't just say, I'm out. By faith, you live through difficulties. Faith does not alleviate the problems of life. Faith gives us a reason. Faith gives us a, a road through the difficulties of life. May I ask you, what kind of faith are you engaged in right now as we sit here this morning together? Is it the faith of a tourist mentality or is it about the long haul? You see, if it's about the long haul, that's called endurance. And that's what Hebrews chapter 12 is all about. Endurance. I'd like to encourage you, brethren, don't fall for what the world's ideas about faith are. It is not just about high spots. It is about the ongoing fight. It's about the long race, the determined endurance of the race under the weight of life. I would encourage you, therefore, to dig. And that's what this writer is doing here in Hebrews. To dig. To stay at it. To stay tough. To be strong. To endure to the end. Under the weight that you must run with. Stay focused. When the distractions and the sins of faithlessness draw near, push through them. Endure through it all. That is why we love the people of chapter 11. That is why we love them and that is why God loves them and that is why God loves us. People of faith. That's what he's looking for. This world is not the friend that helps us draw near to our God. That only comes from God's Word. And a good part of the time, it comes from God's people. Maybe you're thinking today, well, what gives us the ability to persist in these, th these three points that we've talked about this morning? Very quickly, I'd like to run through verses 2 and 3. And so if you'll just be patient with me a minute. Remember when I made that 30-second comment? <laughs> If you just think about what he says, and it really is quite, quite uh, quick. So if you'll just look down there, verses 2 and 3. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Your version may say the author or the creator and perfecter of our faith. How much time do you need to spend? Uh, how much time have you spent this past week, for example, focused upon Jesus, his example? How much has it perfected your faith? 
Made it greater, made it more strong, deeper, more enduring. The word looking here doesn't mean casually glancing over at Jesus. It's not the idea, well, I got this hard time, I'm looking now at Jesus for a second until it goes away. It's a continuation of something. It continues on. To turn the, the eyes away from other things, to fix them intently on something else, in this case, Jesus. Focused with purpose and intent on his example, his plan, his will. I want you to consider his example because the text does. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What can we endure because of our joy that's set before us, brothers and sisters? Despising the shame. It doesn't mean that we have some sick fascination. If only I could have shame. If only I could be hurt. If only this faith thing would, would somehow persecute me and let me know that I'm alive. That's not the idea behind it. Jesus didn't want to suffer the shame. And we see that in the garden. When he prayed to be delivered some other way. It's not some sick fascination with suffering. Nobody likes suffering. Jesus didn't like suffering, but we do endure through it because of the prize that is set before us, the writer says. We desire the end result of our faith more than we are willing to concede, to give up, to lay down, to be faithless. And because of his endurance, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, verse 2 says. Seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What is our promised reward? We're not going to be seated at the right hand of the throne, but we have been promised rewards. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Be faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life, he says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. We may have to endure some things here, but he is promising not over there. Not over there. Faith will see us through that. Or to hear again from Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but look at that, to all who have loved his appearing. And then the Hebrew writer says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. I want you to stop there for just a second and ask yourself, What do I endure that compares to what he has endured? Can you come up with one thing in your life that compares to what Jesus endured on our behalf? Just one. I don't know about you, I cannot. And I don't, well, I know you can't either. And the reason I know that is because he took the sins of not just you and me, but the whole world upon him all at the same time. All at one moment. There's nothing we go through that compares with that. He went all the way. All the way. There's no less that he could have gone. He put everything into it that he had. He gave 100% of himself. Now here's the point. If Jesus could handle every test, every temptation, every trial, every heartache, every pain, even death itself in his life, then he can handle those in yours and in mine. By faith, we know that. And that pushes us onward. Don't forget, you'll be successful in your faith when you lay aside unnecessary weight. And that's a constant struggle. Lay aside the sin of faithlessness, and that's a constant struggle. Embrace endurance. You know what I'm going to say. And don't forget, looking unto Jesus intently, who is the author and the finisher of this thing called faith. Why? So that we may not grow weary and faint-hearted. He is our ultimate encourager. 
of all the people we've looked at, all the way through chapter 11, on into chapter 12 here, he is the ultimate encourager. He did what none others could or would do. Psalm 40, verse 4, Blessed is the one who makes the Lord his trust. Let's close in prayer together. Our Holy Father in heaven, we look to you this morning as we consider those who have lived before us of faith. We come to you as our source of redemption as they did. Our, our hearts turn toward you. We pray for the weak this morning. We pray for the struggling. We pray for the faithless. We pray for those who might be lukewarm. We pray for those who have lost their spiritual appetite and sight. And for them, we ask that you regain it for them. Through any means that is necessary, bring them back to you. Set heaven again as their home. Be with us who recognize the struggle of faith. We are hesitant to ask us to give us more faith. We recognize, Father, that that means greater endurance because our faith only grows through that. And oftentimes with endurance comes problems in life that we must see through. But Father, if it is between losing heaven and gaining heaven through the problems of this life, then we ask for the problems. Strengthen our faith as we look upon Jesus, our Savior. Help us to outlast hostility of sinners. Seeing the joy that is set, help us to endure as Jesus did. And help us to see Him seated at Your right hand, having gained victory and knowing by faith in Your grace we too have assured victory that is yet to come. Give us outlasting joy, which powers through the difficult and tough times of life, that we may continue to be people of real, genuine, enduring faith as you have described to us here in the Scriptures. Help us to have confidence, O oh God, that we can be just like those we read of in chapter 11. And in Jesus' name, we say together, Amen. Now, maybe today it is that you find yourself ready to put your trust in the Lord. It's not that hard to start, but you need to know for sure you're going to have to grow. But you also need to know for sure there is nothing like being a faithful child of God. It's the best thing you could ever be part of. If you're subject to his call this morning, ready to turn in repentance from sin to him, to be immersed in baptism, to be resurrected, this new person, wrapping yourself in the blood of Jesus Christ and forgiveness, won't you take that step right now?